Good morning and welcome to worship here at Providence Presbyterian Church in Fairfax, Virginia. Wherever you are logging on for this online worship service, we welcome you and are glad that you are here. So welcome to those who are logging on from different parts of our nation as we seek to give glory to God and call ourselves together in Christ's name to worship this living God through our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ. Many things are happening in the life of this congregation. We hope that you'll take time to download the bulletin and find out what's going on. We want you to know that even though this sanctuary is empty, at one time we will be back together as a family of faith. But until that time, as the church is deployed, know that God is with you even now in your own homes. Uh, those of you that are working from home or have started back to work, know that God is with you. We have many things, as I said, going on in the life of this congregation, so that we hope that you'll continue to log on to our website. We want to say a special thank you to those who continue to support us with our ministry. For those who want to know more, you can go to our website, www.providencechurch.org. And in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a little tab that says Give. You can log on, enter, and give and support our ministry. And we are thankful that in these difficult and trying times that you continue to support us as the church is deployed doing the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, welcome, sisters and brothers in Christ. Let us worship God. <laughs> Today's scripture reading comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Listen now for the word of the Lord. 
There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken away from it. God does it so that people will fear him. Whatever is has already been and what will be has been before and God will be called to the past to account. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Our gospel lesson this morning is taken from John's gospel, the fifth chapter beginning with the first verse. Hear God's word as it comes to us from John. After this, there was a festival of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate there was a pool, called in Hebrew Beth Zayatha, which has five porticos. And these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man who was there had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Stand up, take your mat, and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the religious leader said to the man who had been cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered them, The man who made me well said to me, Take up your mat and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take it up and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had disappeared into the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Do not sin anymore, so nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the religious leaders that it was Jesus who made him well. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for your words from Holy Scripture that call us to faithfulness, that challenge us with words that help us understand that we have been loved from the beginning, that you had created us with purpose, and you call us to discipleship. So Lord, we ask that you inspire us by your Scriptures, by your Word, so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, for we ask it. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a great story I want to share with you about the jazz great Wynton Marsalis. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to hear how amazing his trumpet playing is and what a virtuoso he is on that instrument, but his ability to play jazz is truly phenomenal. He has a musical family. There's a story that on a summer night back in 2001, a music critic, composer, professor, David Hadju, 
decided to join the village vanguard crowd, which is one of the city's oldest and most prestigious jazz clubs in New York City. Hatchew was there to report on Wynton Marsalis' performance, and he writes about the time that in the middle of this, I don't stand a ghost of a chance, that Marsalis was bringing the music up to a climax. It was phenomenal. And then someone's cell phone went off. Oh my goodness, have you ever been in that situation? This person was so embarrassed, he didn't know how to shut off the phone, and he ran out of that auditorium. The music stopped. Wynton Marsalis raised his eyebrows, and there was silence. But then he did something amazing. He replayed the notes of that ringtone with his trumpet, and there was a pause, and he did it again. And pretty soon, he was improvising on that riff of that ringtone, moving in and out, changing the keys, moving it around, and then having the band come in. And he kept going and going and going. And when he was done, there was applause. There was a standing ovation. People were amazed that how we took these sour notes and made them into something amazing and beautiful. We have been given a lot of difficult things to deal with, with COVID-19, things going on in our country. And if that's not difficult enough, we have an election that's going to be coming up soon. So there's a lot of sour notes and a lot of sour people around, a lot of complaining. And I think the question for us is what will we do in this season of improvisation, if you will? We have been thrown so many different things around the world, and especially in our country, dealing with COVID-19. We've had to change our schedules. We had to do so many different things. And when we thought it was going to be over, it's still here. Some are confused. Some are worried. Some want to push ahead. It certainly is a time for improvisation. What are we going to do with the sour notes that we've been dealt can we just complain about them, or is there some kind of resolution? In jazz, there are no bad notes or sour notes. There's only bad resolutions. Because of changing keys and moving around that melody line, Marsalis was able to take those sour notes, if you will, that interrupted his performance and make it into something wonderful. So the question I have this morning, what will we do with these sour notes that we have been dealt? It's not our fault, it's here. It's a product of disease. We can talk about who's to blame, I am sure, at a later time. But what's more important is how we respond, how we move forward. I gave our What's Up Wednesday group a little preview of my sermon by talking about Wynton Marsalis. But I also move that conversation along to a meditation from Psalm 40. You know those great words that you too made into a song years ago. Here's the word of the psalmist. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to hear my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. This is certainly a time for patience. And I don't know about you, but I have a hard time being patient. It's very difficult to somehow be saddled with all these challenges. But the psalmist is confident that if he waits patiently for the Lord, God will hear his cry. And not only that, God will deliver him from the miry bog, from the desolate pit, and set his feet upon a rock, making his steps secure, so that there will be a new song in his mouth, a new song of praise to our God. It seems to me that this is the challenge that we've been dealt. We have some sour notes, and what will we do with those? Will we be patient with God? We'll be asking God's help to let us set our feet upon a secure place, a solid rock or foundation so our steps are secure. 
Can we be patient? In our gospel lesson this morning, we have this amazing story of this person that is lying by these pools of healing water, and he wants to be healed. Jesus comes by, sees him, seems to know he's been there a long time. What can I do for you? And this man is healed. He picks up his mat and he goes away, praising God. But it's an interesting story if we look at this in a little bit more detail. So let's look at this a little bit more closely. One man who was there had been ill for 38 years. For 38 years, this man had been ill, and Jesus could tell that even that day as he was walking by, that man had been there a long time. Jesus just knew. Jesus had a clear identity of what this person's issue was and how that he could help. So I asked the question, do we have a clear identity of who we are? This man is only identified as a man who has been ill for 38 years, and I'm sure that had a lot to do with his attitude about life. Maybe some of you have been living with pain a long time. It's not an easy thing to deal with. Maybe it's not a physical pain of some health issue, but maybe it's a spiritual pain, a pain in your family of separation or alienation. But do you have a view or a clear identity of how God sees you and how God wishes to be there at your side, how God wishes to help? One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. Jesus sees him and knew that he had been there a long time and simply asked, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made well? Have you ever been around somebody that has a negative attitude all the time? It can be very frustrating. You know, some people do have that sense that uh, life is a glass that's half full, others half empty. But that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those people that seem to always have a negative attitude. Something had happened in their life, whether it's physical pain, emotional pain, something they haven't been able to get rid of that has shaped their character, shaped who they are. And sometimes people use those sour things that happen in their lives to take themselves to a greater plane, to turn it into something marvelous. And others seem to always be stuck in that frame of mind. This man certainly has a lot of self-pity. When Jesus says, do you want to be made well, The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. For 38 years, apparently that was the issue. The healing that he needed was only a few feet away. And somehow he couldn't get there and was feeling sorry for himself. And in fact, he turns that self-pity into blaming others. Now, I'm not suggesting he didn't have good reason for self-pity. I'm not sure how I would deal with being paralyzed. If somehow God, in God's wisdom, I didn't know how to get out of that situation... So I'm not putting any blame on this paralyzed man, but so often we are just like this person when we have self-pity and it's someone else's fault. But the Bible talks about responsibility as well. And what does Jesus do? The sick man asks, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool. When the water is stirred up and while I'm making my way, someone else steps ahead of me. I think Jesus helps him get rid of that blaming attitude. When he asks him what he wants him to do, Jesus finally responds, stand up, take your mat, and walk. And immediately he stands up, he's cured, he takes his mat, he begins to walk, and then there's those religious leaders that are all upset because they see this man carrying his mat And on the Sabbath, you're not supposed to work. 
And always, often that's interpreted by the religious leaders when someone's working and when someone isn't, even though they had some things in the law that would guide them. And the man says, I don't know who, i just doing what this man told me. They asked, who was he? He said, I don't know. I guess Jesus had already somehow gone into the crowd, and this man didn't even know who had helped him. Later on, Jesus runs into him and tells him to sin no more so that nothing else may happen to him. But it's a great story, I think, in this sense, because it helps us to think about the situation we are in right now with COVID-19, with some of the issues, and I know that many are dreading all the back and forth that's going to happen during this election time. But know that as Christians, as Presbyterians, we are called to be one. We are called to look at all these sour things that are going on and somehow put them together and change those notes around and make something beautiful and wonderful. So for us, it's a time of improv, to be sure. But maybe you're not really good at jazz or improv, but it's a time for all of us to turn to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and ask for help. And that's what the psalmist did. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the miry bog, out of the desolate pit, and set my feet upon a firm foundation so that my steps would be secure. That's what I'm praying for in this time or this season of improvisation. Learning how to take some of these sour notes and make something marvelous out of them, but it surely takes patience. It surely takes prayer, and it surely cannot happen without God's help. So I think in our passage of John, we have some clear ideas. Have a clear identity of who you are. You are created in the image of God. God loves you. God has loved you from the beginning. God calls you to be a faithful disciple. Have a clear identity that you were created to take these sour notes that can be dealt out and make something marvelous, something wonderful, something beautiful. You may not get a standing ovation like Wynton Marsalis did in that New York City jazz nightclub, but I bet all the angels in heaven will be cheering and clapping, and our Lord Jesus Christ will be there to help you move forward. Have a clear identity that you are loved by God, that God knows your pain, that God knows your circumstance, and that God can transform and change your life. Secondly, reject self-pity. We're always going through difficult times in our life, to be sure, but say no to that and say yes to God. It's easy to wallow there in self-pity, and some people for many very good reasons, but you can't live there. You can't live in that state. That's no life. Hear God's clarion call and move move beyond and reject self-pity in your life. And third, get rid of a blaming attitude. I'm so tired of everyone blaming things on someone else. Take individual responsibility. Take corporate responsibility as a congregation to make a difference in our world. Take that responsibility on yourself and get rid of a blaming attitude. And finally, seek help from others. That man had been there for 38 years, and I'm not blaming him, but in 38 years he'd been in that situation. He could get no one to lift him into the pool until Jesus comes along. Jesus gives us our example that we should seek to help others. As we look in our world today, we can't save the world. Jesus has done that on the cross and through his resurrection. But God may have given us particular things that we can be concerned about. Seek to help others. In this season or this time of improvisation, if you will, allow God to help turn your sour notes into a marvelous resolution and a new beginning. That man jumped to his feet because Jesus healed him and he had a new beginning. God can be with us 
God can heal our world, heal our country, heal our souls, and give us a new beginning. So friends, have patience. Pray for patience. Pray for your church leaders that we too will have patience. Pray for our people on the front line that are trying to seek an end to COVID-19. But also pray for our nation as we go into this time and all the pre-election things that will happen. We can be good together. Have a clear identity that you're loved. Reject self-pity. Get rid of that blaming attitude and seek to help others. I think that's clear from our passage of Scripture today that Jesus loves each and every one of us and is calling all of us to a new beginning. Please join me in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and ever-loving God, we thank you for the opportunity to be called as your disciples. Help us turn the sour notes that we've been given in our world today into something marvelous by the help of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we wait patiently for you, inclined to hear our cry and set our feet upon a rock so that our steps will be secure. Lord, thank you for loving us from the beginning and guide us this week as we seek to be faithful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Transgressions the prophet Elijah has sealed the heavens through the word of God. I therefore say to ye, forsake your idols, return to God, for he is slow to anger and merciful and kind and gracious. As we come for our time for prayer, I want to uh, begin by acknowledging that um, I know that as we go through this COVID pandemic, we all have ups and downs. In my conversations with you, as well as 
in mixed conversations with you, we have heard how at times we feel we are coping well with all the things that are going on with this pandemic and indeed in the world. And then there are times where in my life, I call it the COVID breakdown where things just seem very hard and depression and anxiety can seep in. As we have been talking to many of you over these, uh, over these months and weeks, there seems to be a theme of exhaustion. And we have been asked to do many things that we did not anticipate. Our minds are being asked to think about things that we couldn't have imagined months ago. So as a part of our prayer today, I'm going to be reading A Blessing by poet, author, and priest John O'Donohue. The blessing is called For One Who Is Exhausted. Let us join our hearts and minds in prayer. Gracious and holy God, we do come to you with thanksgiving because we know that we have been blessed. We thank you for those things in our lives, many of which go unnoticed, those little things uh, that we take for granted, something as small as our cup of coffee and a bit of quiet in the morning. We thank you for laughter when it comes with our loved ones or with our friends. We thank you for those times when you have opened eye, our eyes to the beauty that is in someone else and also to the beauty that is in the world that surrounds us. We only have to take a walk outside and be intentional about noticing the beauty of your creation. God, we pray for this beautiful world that you have given us. We pray for those who are leading in our neighborhoods, in our communities, in our cities and nation, and indeed in the world. God, such hard decisions are having to be made. God, I say a special prayer of thanksgiving and ask a blessing upon the officers of our church. They have faithfully been praying and thinking and praying and thinking as they make hard decisions about hard things when we do not know what the future will hold. And we ask that you continue to help us walk in the way of your will, in the way that you would have us go. And thank you so much for the commitment of, of the members of our, of our church to help us move forward in ministry in different ways, even during this pandemic. God, I know you know the prayers of our hearts that aren't unsaid, but you also know that this theme of exhaustion has come around for most of us. So we thank you for the gift of creativity that you have given John O'Donohue as he gives this blessing. When the rhythm of the heart becomes hectic, time takes on the strain until it breaks, then all the unattended stress falls in on the mind like an endless increasing weight. The light in the mind becomes dim. Things you could take in your stride before now become laborsome events of the will. Weariness invades your spirit. Gravity begins falling inside of you, dragging down every bone. The tide you never valued has gone out and you are marooned on unsure ground. Something within you has closed down and you cannot push yourself back to life. You have been forced to enter empty time. The desire that drove you has relinquished. There is nothing else to do now but rest and patiently learn to receive the self you have forsaken in the race of days. At first, your thinking will darken and sadness take over like listless weather. The flow of unwept tears will frighten you. You have traveled too fast over false ground and now your soul has come to take you back. Take refuge in your senses, open up to all the small miracles you rushed through. Become inclined to watch the way of rain when it falls slow and free. Imitate the habit of twilight, taking time to open the well of color that fostered the brightness of day. 
draw alongside the silence of stone until its calmness can claim you. Be excessively gentle with yourself. Stay clear of those vexed in spirit. Learn to linger around someone of ease who feels they have all the time in the world. And gradually, you will return to yourself having learned a new respect for your heart and the joy that dwells far within slow time. God, we thank you for the gift of lament that always ends in promise. So we stand on your promise of presence. We stand on your pr promise that you've got this. We stand and put all our hope in you. For we pray all these prayers, both said and unsaid, in the name of your Son, who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We are so glad that you have been with us. And now as you go out into the world and into the beginning of this week, may the Lord God bless you and keep you. May the Lord God be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor upon you now and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen.